Hello everyone and welcome back to yet another full card breakdown video. I'm 138 MMA and I'm here to take this card from the prelims all the way to the main event and break down each and every individual fight, give you my pick, my prediction, and then possibly a few bets here and there that I think would be a, a you know good option for you on this card. Here's the thing I want to point out ahead of time. I lost my backside on Silvana Gomez Juarez on, on UFC 281. So I'm a little more on slim pickings in this one. But also, this is a very well-matched up card. So you get a lot of guys uh, and gals who are very well matched up uh, with an opponent of equal skill or a lot of variables in a fight. So there's not a ton of bets particularly unless you play them just right. But stay tuned to the video because I'm going to point out a few. I'm also going to kind of break down why I... I feel the way I do about each individual fight. So don't worry, you're still going to get all the information that you expect from 138 MMA. And if this is your first time coming to the channel, welcome. It's good to meet you. Please consider subscribing to this video if you've decided that at the end of this video that you enjoy this content and would like to see more breakdowns from me in the future. And also, if you're back again, you've enjoyed all my content, go ahead and like the video now so you don't forget later. I'll see you on the first fight. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, 138 MMA proudly brings to you the hottest picks in the world! Right, kicking this thing off, we've got Teresa Bleda taking on Natalia Silva in the women's flyweight division. Both ladies 5-0 and in their last five fights. Teresa Bleda has never lost. She is undefeated in her amateur and pro career, so we'll see. Maybe she'll get her first loss here, maybe she won't. Let's break it down a little bit, shall we? The height and reach disadvantage for Natalia Silva is very, very big. We've got 5'4 to 5'9 and 65 inch reach to 71. That is a massive disadvantage in height and reach. And that is going to play a role here because Natalia Silva being the striker, she's a very good striker. Don't get me wrong. Her best weapon is her kicks, but she's a good striker overall. She's going to have a hard time reaching someone as, as lanky compared to her. Uh, as Teresa Bleda is, that's going to that's going to be a lot bigger difference uh, in this matchup than it will for on the Natalia Silva side than it would have been on the other side for Bleda being more of the wrestling focused fighter. So for Bleda, she is a very strong wrestler, as I pointed out there. Obviously, when you're on the ground, yes, height and reach kind of do they play a role, but in the striking, if I can hit my opponent say five six inches before they can hit me. Well, guess what? That's a huge advantage. So for Natalia Silva, that is a obstacle that she's going to have to overcome here. And maybe she will because she does have pretty darn good footwork. So that's something I wanted to point out. Her footwork is solid. Her volume is solid. So if she's able to come through with that volume, use her footwork to go in and out and avoid that long range of Bleda, she'll have more, more luck in the striking department there. Uh, if the fight does end up on the ground, however, she does have some good Brazilian jiu-jitsu and she is dangerous off her back. A concern that I do have, though, is if she does get taken down, she might be content to try to work some submissions off her back instead of getting up or at least trying to get up and get back to striking, which is what her best path to victory would be. Because on this fight here, Blayda is not a striker. Her striking is very basic. She is able to use her, her, her natural tools that she has, her height, her reach, and she's a fairly strong individual. So... Although it's basic, if she hits you, you're going to feel it, especially at 125. She does have experience at bantamweight as well. So she's a strong, strong woman for, and for this weight class especially. So for her, her best path to victory is to get it to the ground because what does she do really well? Ground and pound, and she's vicious with it. So for Blida, her ground and pound is her strongest attribute, I would say. She can submit you, yes, but she will pound your face into oblivion beforehand if she can get a hold of you. Um, she does also work well from the cage push. She gets you up against the fence, work work the work some takedowns from there, but also kind of work you over with some strikes, you know, soften you up, win some minutes. In this matchup, I think it's a really interesting one, and Natalia Silva is the favorite here. Um, I don't know the exact odds, but she's the favorite here. Probably because of her last fight, she did look really good in that last outing. Um, kind of surprised a lot of people. People are forgetting. So... If you look, if you've been around the channel for a while, you saw my Dana White's Contender Series breakdowns. Teresa Bleda is coming off the Dana White's Contender Series. I was big on her going into her, her Contender Series fight, and she did not disappoint. The commentators, they were not impressed with her striking. Well, yeah, she's not a striker. Her grappling, though, whoo, she looked good. So for Bleda, 
her clear path to victory is get the takedown. And I don't think that that's going to be an issue here. I think she's going to be able to get the, the takedown at some point in the fight. When she does, that ground and pound is so nasty. She's going to be able to deal some damage. So for me, I like the I like the underdog in Blada here. Wouldn't bet a lot on this fight, but, you know, just because Natalia Silva is a, is a legitimate striker. But for me, I think Blada is a solid pick here. I think wrestlers tend to beat strikers. It's just the way that it is. So, yeah, some strikers can avoid it. I mean, Adesanya did it for how long now? He was able to avoid takedowns. And then, you know, I mean, of course he lost recently, just last Saturday, but wasn't to a wrestler. So he was able to do it. He was at the highest of levels, okay? Natalia Silva's good. She's not that good. She's not Adesanya level good. I don't think she's going to be able to avoid Blada for all three rounds on the takedown, and I think it's coming at some point. With that, she also has the added disadvantage of the height and reach. For me, that gives me enough to say, okay, I'll take the dog here. I'm leaning Blada. Let me know what you guys think, but we've got many more to cover, so let's go ahead and do those. Here we have a matchup in the men's bantamweight division between Fernie Garcia and Brady Heastand. He stand coming in three and two in his last five, four and one on the Garcia side. And this is yet another matchup where the striker is at a reach disadvantage and a pretty sizable one. Uh, for he stand, he comes in five foot eight to Fernie Garcia's five seven. Not a big difference there, but the big difference is in the actual reach itself. 71 inch reach on the he stand side, only 67 inches of reach for Garcia. Now for Garcia, he's proportionate. That makes sense. You should, if you're five foot seven, that is 67 inches. That adds up. It's he stand on the other hand that has the longer wingspan than he is tall, which is a big advantage over the others uh, over the striker. A striker needs or not necessarily needs wants that reach, and that's uh, that's something that we're not going to get on the Fernie Garcia side here. So for Fernie Garcia, he does have pretty de decent boxing. His fast hands are what give him that boxing though. His fast hands are what make make his boxing so good. He doesn't really throw with a ton of power. Um, yes, he can knock you out, but it's because of the speed of his punches that can knock a guy out. So uh, if you don't see a punch coming, you're more likely to get knocked out. Let's put it that way. And with that fast hands, I mean, get them to your chin before you knew that even threw a punch. So he's quick. That's good. He does have decent wrestling of his own. Probably not the best matchup to use it in. I don't know that he stands going to be a guy that he's going to be able to take down. And he probably won't use it. Don't get me wrong. He probably won't. Doesn't really kick much either. Basically just boxing and MMA. Uh, he, you know, he, he has decent takedown defense, but I just against a wrestler like he stand, he's going to really be putting that to the use if he can't crack him early. So, or sucker, he stand into a striking battle because guess what? His striking is pretty basic. Not great, uh, but he does throw power punches. He's a strong, powerful guy and he does have a reach advantage. So there is that to play into that. The re the wrestling on he stand side is where, where everything is. So he's very strong wrestling, good chain wrestling, this one takedown after another, he can hit you with those. He makes a pace out of his pressure and his cardio, and he will put that pace on you and wrestle you and make you wear down and beat you that way. And for me, I'm actually really big on Brady Heastand in this matchup. I don't think Fernie Garcia has the tools to stop a guy like Heastand. It's just a stylistic nightmare for him in this matchup. A guy that's only going to be punching. The kicks aren't there to use to make up for the distance and reach that he doesn't have. A guy like Heastand is going to be able to duck one of those shots, make an entry, get the takedown, and win rounds. Will he get the finish? Ah, eh, I don't know. But Heastand, at the odds you can get him at now, is still playable. I like Heastand here a lot. Two fights in. We still we have two plays already, or two that I would say are decent. I do really like Heastand. Let me know what you guys think. Let's go to the next Exciting fight. Exciting strawweight matchup between these two ladies, Vanessa Demopoulos and Maria Oliveira. Both ladies three and two in their last five fights. I'm going to take a quick moment to point something out here. I do have a slight bias on this fight. I'm going to try not to let it cloud my judgment, but it may a little. Uh, Vanessa Demopoulos, her jujitsu coach from back when she was uh, fighting for Tough Enough. Uh, it's like it was early in the when she just crossed over to MMA. She used to do all sorts of other different things, different activities. But when she just crossed over into MMA. Her jiu-jitsu coach, his name's Zeke, he was a, uh, he's a good friend of mine. We used to, we used to work together. Um, real great guy. Anyway, I have a bit of a bias towards Vanessa Demopoulos because of that. I'm going to try not to let it cloud my judgment here, but we're going we're gonna to just go ahead and get that out of the way. Don't eat me up in the comments saying that, you know, whatever. I, I admitted to it. I'm going to tell you if I have a bias. I'm not going to pretend that I don't. Okay, anyway, here's the fight. Here's the breakdown. We have another matchup with a big reach disadvantage for one of the fighters. This time it's on the grappler's side. 
For Vanessa Dimopoulos, she's five foot two with a 62 inch reach. On the other side, Oliveira, I, I thought that was made up. I thought that 62 inch reach, there was no way, but it is, it's, it's real. On the other side, for Oliveira, she's five foot six with a 69 inch reach. So she's got pretty good wingspan there uh, because 69 inches, that would be five nine. So girl's got a big wingspan. What that means is she has a seven inch reach advantage and she is the better striker of the two. So that's really gonna be a beneficial thing for her, especially because she strikes at range. She's a good striker, but she can strike well at range. So that is a big advantage for her. The problem is her grappling, eh, not so much. On the other side, we have a girl who's not very good at striking. The is striking is just kind of wing wild shots to help her get in close. Yeah, she can land them and it's, you know, whatever, but her striking is not, not good. Her takedowns, also not usually that good. If she, if she gets dropped and you follow her down to the ground, you're in for trouble. However, she can get the takedown if your takedown defense isn't that good. So in this instance, it may happen. And if it does, the good news is she can need a shot on the way in and still get a hold of you. Because Dumopoulos has, I mean, as much as we've seen her in her fights in the UFC so far, the girl's been hit a lot and she hasn't been put out yet. She are, I don't think she has anyway. I don't remember watching any knockouts when I was watching those. She's been dropped really bad a couple of times, but she's still conscious, so she can eat shots. Uh, Silvana Gomez Juarez, we just talked about her at the uh, intro to this video, or this, uh, yeah, this whole video breakdown. She dropped her, went to the ground with her, didn't go too well for her. So anyway, in this matchup, the volume of Demopolis mixed with the, those wild hands is what's going to get her past that reach if she can get past that reach. And she's very dangerous off her back. If she can get to this to the ground, she'll be throwing up arm bars, looking for chokes, whatever. If she can get on top, even better. So for me, I would leave this one off your, your slips entirely. I don't like this matchup because if it goes to decision, you're probably getting Oliveira. As the winner. If it doesn't go to decision, you're probably getting Demopolis as the winner. And I don't know which way this goes. You could play it if you want. Because I don't I don't think Oliveira is going to be able to, to finish Demopolis. Because Demopolis has eaten shots from more powerful strikers in the past and been okay. So if you want to play it like this, this is the way I would play it if I was going to play it. I'm not going to play it because I'm not crazy. But if you wanted to, if you're a total degenerate and you will have to play it, you take Oliveira... By decision, and then you play Demopolis at the money line because you can get her even money. So if you take Demopolis at the money line and she wins, you get your money back. Because you, you'll bet it on this side. If you take Oliveira by decision with the same amount of money, you win if she wins. But either way, you're covered. That's how I would play it if I was going to play it. I'm not going to play it. I just want to leave this one off and watch it. Like I said, I have a bias. So my official pick, though, I'm going to take Demopolis. I think she gets it done, but that's probably because I'm biased. So, yeah, I mean, you can say whatever in the comments. That's what it is. Let's go to the next fight. There's a few more on this card that I really like. So let's go to those. Folks, in the men's bantamweight division, we have Ricky Tercios taking on Kevin Natividad in a matchup where I would leave this one off my cards. And let me tell you why. Because without context, it doesn't really matter what I say. So... But for the context, first things first, let's cover the cover the height and reach discrepancy because there's a lot of those on this card. We have five foot six with a 70 inch reach for the Natividad side, five nine with a 72 inch reach on the Tertio side. I don't think this is going to play a big big role in this fight, but I wanted to point it out because it is a two inch reach advantage uh, for the Tertio side and a three inch in height advantage for the Tertio side. Here's the thing: we've got Tertios, who's a guy who lacks in striking defense. Why do I say that? Well, because he just gets hit a lot. He does. He really does. Um, against a guy who has a very questionable chin. He's been knocked out quite a few times in the UFC. But for Natividad, you'd say, oh, a guy that can strike like Tercios, he strikes pretty well, right? Well, he also doesn't have any power on his punches. And you can see that because he can land a whole lot of shots on someone and just not knock them down or not knock them out. So, uh, yes, he can get knockouts. It, he has done them in his career. He just doesn't throw with a ton of power. So for Natividad, how bad is that chin? Do the shots of Tercios rattle him? I don't know, but let's get let's break through the full breakdown here, and then we'll we'll go into what the final pick's going to be. So for Tercios, some things I do like about him: his volume and his activity on the feet, great. Even on the ground, he's active. He's just active. He's an active fighter. Love it. Doesn't always land all of his shots, but he's active, and the volume is good. So I do like that. 
uh, in the Zahabi fight that he had last, threw a ton of shots, but missed most of them. I don't know what he was doing. He was just kind of like hitting air, but you know, whatever. Uh, we'll see if he can land some of these shots. Kevin Tividad isn't really known for being a guy that's hard to hit per se. Um, I mean, he's been knocked out quite a few times already. So either way, uh, but for Tertios, he is also pretty good on the mat. So with Natividad, he is a decent wrestler and he does have decent grappling. I would, I would almost say good, but just to go for what to go off of, I'll, I'll say decent here. Uh, for Tertios, his scrambling is what really gets gets him the best positions because what he he will throw up submissions all the time. Yep, he's very active off his back, but in the scrambles, that's what makes his jujitsu look better than it probably is technically. He does have good jujitsu or at least decent. Um, but when he can scramble and get himself to better positions, he can he can open up things just by being in a more advantageous position faster than his opponent can do anything. So so that's what I mean there. Um, and overall, I'd like the game of Tertios if he just fixed a few things. Connected on more of these shots, not just throwing them in air, uh, obviously. You know, fix that striking defense a little bit. You can't just get hit that long or that much and have a long career in the UFC. Um, the power, not a big deal, honestly. If you come out with that much volume, you're probably going to win fights. And so for Tertios, I like a lot about him. There's just a couple of little things that give me pause. And on the other side, for Kevin Natividad, the dude's a power puncher, and he's got good good wrestling and grappling, or at least decent good wrestling and grappling. So there's some stuff I like over there, but I just can't trust his chin to maintain in any fight after being knocked out so many times. For me, I'm passing. If I'm going to have to make a pick, have to make a pick though, and that's what I will do because that's what I do in these videos, I'm going to lean the Tertio side, but I'm not confident in it whatsoever. And I will not be placing a bet on this, and I will not advise any of you to do that as well. So that's my opinion. Let me, let me know what you guys think in the comments. Let's move to the next Real fight. Quick, if you haven't done so already and you've been enjoying this content so far, hit like for me. I appreciate it. It helps my videos grow. It helps people find my videos. Whatever, you know the drill. Please like it. I appreciate it. Let's get into this fight. Miles Johns taking on Vince Morales. Finally, one I don't have to break down the height and reach. So in this one, we've got Johns coming in three and two in his last five fights. Two and three on the Morales side. I, wah, I don't like this fight. Here's why I don't like this fight. Miles Johns is kind of inconsistent because he's a darn good wrestler and he doesn't always want to use it. He does have power in the hands, but, you know, if you can wrestle and win a fight for sure against a guy that's going to let you take him down, sometimes he'll still try to throw hands with him. That's a bad strategy. Um, he's also taking this fight on short notice. On the other hand, Vince Morales can do just about everything pretty well. He's a jack of all trades, if you will. He has good volume and good forward pressure, and that's what will win in most of his fights when he does win. I don't like this fight whatsoever. There's a world where Morales wins and there's a world where Johns wins and Johns is probably more likely to win if this is a full camp. Um, it's not quite. It is a short notice fight. Not the original opponent, like I said. <clears throat> For me, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this fight. I will pick Johns just ever so slightly on this one. However, I don't trust it. I would leave it out the cards. If he goes in there and just wants to sling hands... The footwork and the movement of Morales is probably going to be tough for him to land. Maybe he lands a big shot. Maybe he doesn't. But we're just we're just gambling at that point. And I know that it's called gambling, but it's not gambling when you make smart bets. It's making a smart bet, and you'll win out more often than not. Sure, the house always wins, but that ain't on you. They're not winning your money. But with that said, I don't trust Johns to do the right things to win the fight. I don't know that he's going to use that wrestling that he uses when he needs to use it and mix it in with his striking. And I also don't think Morales is necessarily that... Uh, I don't think he's necessarily better than Johns everywhere. And I don't think he's better than Johns in an area that he can capitalize on throughout the whole fight. Maybe he is. Maybe he'll prove me wrong. So for the sake of a pick, I'm picking Johns, but I don't trust it at all. Let's go to the next fight. Next up in the women's flyweight division, we have Marina Moroz coming in 3-2 and two in her last five fights and Jennifer Maya, 2-3 and three in her last five fights. Now for Jennifer Maya, that two and three looks a little bit rough. She's lost to some of the best competition, one of which being the champ. Uh, Manon Fierro is another one in there. So I mean, you're, you're getting you're getting some high level competition that she's losing to. It's not like she's uh, it's not like she's just totally done, totally downhill at this point. Two and three in her last five does not look good. But Maya's lost to some of the best in this division. On the other hand, the three and two for Moreau, she's looked pretty good lately. She's been adding some new wrinkles to her game. So we're going to kind of cover this this fight uh, a little bit differently here. First thing, we're going to point out the height and reach here. So 5'4 to 5'7, 64 inches to 70 or 67 inches. 
Now, this is an interesting one here because Jennifer Maya does, when in the striking department, she does use Muay Thai really well. Uh, so for Muay Thai, obviously you've got more kicks than you do on the boxing side for Moreau's. And kicks typically have a better reach than punches. So I don't know how much this is gonna come into play. Uh, Moreau's, she, Muay Thai is a good counter to boxing and boxing is a good counter to Muay Thai. So they counter each other well. So for this, with Jennifer Maya, obviously, what's what's a, what's a good way to take out a boxer? Well, they're usually heavy on their lead leg because they want to use that to go forward with their punches. Um, and if you've watched any traditional boxers, they're very heavy on that lead leg. Moreau's being a tra more traditional boxer. She does have a very high-level boxing background. She's more likely going to let that leg be kicked a bit from the, the more uh, more well well-versed in the Muay Thai department, Jennifer Maya. So for Jennifer Maya, working those kicks to the legs, to the body, mixing things up like that, is gonna be good to slow down the boxer. However, for the boxer, when you crowd the Muay Thai fighter, they have to then they have to then change their style and then go for the clinch. Yep, that's a thing. Uh, then you've got the dirty boxing on the Moreau side, you've got the Thai clinch on the on the Maya side. Uh, for for Moreau's though, if she can get in close enough that she's out of the kicking range, or at least mostly out of kicking range, but still in boxing range and not quite in clinching range, she's going to have a lot of a lot of success with the boxing. So for this one, it's kind of interesting. There, there are two counters to each other here um, in the in the boxing department and the Muay Thai department. Uh, on the on the Muay Thai, or I mean, on the boxing side for Moreau's, she's volume over power. She does have good volume. I really like that. She'll throw a lot of punches down range at you. So it's not going to give you a lot of time to stand there and think about what you're going to do because there's punches coming down down the pipe right at you. I do like that. Like I said, not a ton of power. It's women's MMA though, so there's not a lot of a lot of fighters that have just a ton of power. There are some. It's just it's just a thing that you're gonna see less of in women's MMA. It's it's not it's not a good or a bad thing. It's just a thing. Okay, so there's that. Uh, she has added the added wrinkle to her game of her decent wrestling and grappling that she's kind of brought on more uh, more recently in her career, or you know, relatively recently. Um, cause she does have that boxing background, not, no, not so much a wrestling background per se, but she's brought it on and she's gotten, got some good success with it. However, do you really want to take down Jennifer Maya? That's a good question because Jennifer Maya does have some strong Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. If you get to the ground with her, she can sweep, she can take the top position, win some rounds there. She can work her ground and pound in. She'd probably even submit you with that. So that's not something that you want. However, if you don't initiate the takedown, her takedowns are not that good. So for Maya, her takedowns, she more or less needs you to get the fight to the ground or she can pull guard. And pulling guard is an option for her because her jujitsu jiu is pretty darn good. So I can see her using that at some point in this fight. Uh, the other thing that I want to point out is the striking defense on the side of Maya is not so good compared to the, uh, the Moreau's side. However, I don't think the striking defense is going to do anything about the leg because she's going to get leg kicked a lot. That's uh, my guess anyway, based on the, the Muay Thai skill of Jennifer Maya. For me, this fight comes down to one, a couple of things. And there are questions that we won't have answered until the fight. This one is not a clear fight to pick. I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to place a bet on this. I honestly, I still am not certain who I'm picking in this fight. I'm going to edge the Jennifer Maya side. And why do I say that? Well, she has the experience against the top level competitors. She's done well against top level competitors in most uh, situations. She did not look as good against Manon Firo. Firo is a high level kickboxer. Well, guess what? Muay Thai and kickboxing are very similar. They're more or less the same thing. Muay Thai is basically kickboxing from Thailand with just a few different wrinkles. Either way, other than that, Maya's looked good against matchups where her style is not shut down by the other person's style. This is a matchup where it's not. I'm going to lean Maya, not confident at all. There's a world where Moreau's walks her down with punches, scores a takedown at the end of the round, not giving Maya enough time to really do anything with uh, with her jiu-jitsu, and just banks rounds that way, lands the volume. Like I said, the striking defense is not really there for Maya. So for me, I'm going to lean Maya just because I think if it does go to the ground, her jiu-jitsu is going to be there for her. And on the feet, I do think she's going to do enough to make Moreau's consider that takedown and, she get, and Maya gets to win. Not confident whatsoever. I got Maya. Let me know what you guys think. Let's go to the next one. In our next matchup, the men's flyweight division is on the showcase here. We have a matchup where a lot of people are really high on Charles Johnson in this one, from my understanding. 
I've got a few questions before I jump on the Charles Charles Johnson bandwagon here. Uh, we're going to break that down here, but to, in this matchup, Charles Johnson, he's coming in four and one in his last five fights. That that one loss is to Muhammad Mikhaev in his UFC debut, for Johnson that is. Um, Johnson struggled with the wrestling of Muhammad Mikhaev. He was taken down, what, 12-something times. That's not to say that Johnson is a bad wrestler, but in that matchup, he was taken down a lot. But Muhammad Mikhaev is a very aggressive wrestler. On the other hand, on the other side, we have Jalgas Jumagulov. He's coming in one and four in his last five fights. And I would argue that he, that Jumagulov is a better fighter than his one and four shows. He's had a string of fights that didn't quite go his way. Um, he's probably the best fighter to be that bad on a losing record in the UFC. Let's put it that way. So uh, for this matchup here, Jumagulov, good wrestling, good cage push. That's kind of where he's going to have the most success in a fight. And especially against a guy like Charles Johnson, who in his last fight was taken down like 12 times, I think it was. A guy that was taken down so many times, I do think that's because Muhammad Makayev is a very aggressive wrestler. But I can't, at this point, rule out the fact that we don't really know how Charles Johnson's uh, takedown defense is going to do at the UFC level against other UFC level fighters. Jalgas Zumagulov. Although just barely, he is a UFC level fighter. I don't think that he needs, I don't think he just doesn't belong. There are fighters that don't belong in the UFC. There are quite a few of them that are still in the UFC that don't necessarily belong. I don't think Zhaogaz Shumagulov is one of them. He just happens to be towards the bottom of the, of the level. Anyway, his wrestling and his cage push, those are his best path to victories here, paths to victory here against Charles Johnson. Uh, Zhaogaz is also a very aggressive fighter with good volume. He, he will throw the hands. He will get into it like that. The problem is he's got a significant disadvantage in the reach. I don't know why I didn't write it here. But if I check my notes, for whatever reason I didn't, he's only five foot four with a 66-inch reach. Uh, that 66-inch reach, that is a big disadvantage over the 70-inch reach here. And also being five foot four is a uh, is a big disadvantage over the five foot nine. So for Charles Johnson, he's a good wrestler in, on offensively in his own right. He does have good striking. Being that much bigger with a good striking and aggressive guy like Jumagulov can get cracked on the way in because he's going to get hit way before he can land a shot himself. So that is going to be a big, big advantage for uh, Charles Johnson. Johnson does tend to prefer the kicks to the punches, but, um, you know, he does well with the striking either way. Wrestling offensively is good, like I said, but his, his cardio, he showed that in the Muhammad Rakaya fight. You can't get taken down 12 times get without getting back up First off, most of those times, take down, get back up, take down, get back up. That's exhausting. If you don't believe me, have your friend take you down and try to get back up. Now do it 12 times. It's exhausting, okay? Uh, so especially when that friend is trying to hold you down. His wasn't even a friend. It was a guy that was trying to take his head off. So for Charles Johnson, that cardio is really solid. I do think the longer this fight goes on, the more that's going to favor Charles Johnson because although Zhao Gas is ag aggressive with good volume, he can slow down towards the the third round of a fight. The first round, fine. Second round, probably still okay. Third round, he starts to slow down just a little bit, and that's enough that Charles Johnson should be able to take over. My official pick for this matchup is going to be Charles Johnson, but I I just I can't pull the trigger on a bet on him. I want to. The odds are just a little bit out of where I'd be comfortable placing a bet on him in his second fight in the UFC when we didn't really see very much offense out of him in that matchup with Mohamed Bakaya because he was just getting taken down left and right. So and yes, I know he outstruck Muhammad Makayev in that fight, but a lot of those shots were like over the shoulder or like whatever. There weren't any really, any really good moments for him where you're like, oh, he's about to win. Very, no, it, he was definitely not winning that matchup. So either way, I do like Charles Johnson here, but not enough to place a bet for me. If you think I'm crazy and you think Charles Johnson's a lock, please let me know in the comments. I do love to hear your feedback. But without wasting any more time on this one, let's move to the next Next one. up is a welterweight matchup between a couple of guys probably looking to strike their way through this one. In this matchup, we have Danny Roberts, 2-3 and three in his last five fights, taking on Jack Della Maddalena, who is 5-0 oh in his last five fights and is one of the hotter prospects coming up right now in the UFC. In this matchup, Danny Roberts has a bit of a reach advantage and a bit of a height advantage. 6'1 with a 74-inch reach over the 5'11", 73-inch reach of Jack Della Maddalena. I don't think that's going to play a big role here, but I wanted to point it out just so you know that I wasn't overlooking the details. In this matchup, something that is going to play a bit more of a bit more of a, a, a role here, 
35 years of age as opposed to the 26 years of age on the De Jack Della Maddalena side. For Della Maddalena, being an up-and-coming prospect at only 26 years of age, fighting another guy who's been there and done that at, at a pretty high level for most of his career, he's kind of on the end, though. He's 35 years old. You start to see fighters getting, you know, starting to retire or start to see a decline at that point. Is Danny Robertson the decline? I don't know. He's been okay lately. Obviously, he's 2-3 and three in his last five fights. Not the Not something you like to see. But it's not like he's just been out of every one of these fights. Um, he did go to decision against uh, Francisco Trinaldo, another older fighter. But um, I believe that was his last time out. Good fight for, you know, a, a good way to go. You, you don't want to see him getting knocked out every time. He had been knocked out quite a few times before that. Either way, point is, is he at the decline? Some would say, yeah. I would kind of lean, yeah. But... I don't want to say he's totally washed at this point. He's not because he does still have good striking and he does have some good footwork. I do think this is going to be a striking battle and Danny Roberts has a shot in a striking matchup. The problem is on the other side of the cage from him is a guy named Jack Noah Maddalena, who is a good boxer of his own. Of his own. He, is, he does work the jab really well. He has a good volume. He's a high volume, very good volume. Good footwork in his own right. Good footwork over here. Good footwork here. And Jack Noah Maddalena is a tough guy. Like you're not going to just put him down without trouble you know you're gonna you're gonna try and throw some shots on him he's gonna walk through him maybe get a little bloody but guess what he's throwing two three more back at you and that's the thing that you're gonna see from jack della maddalena so for me i think this one's very clear it's gonna be a striking matchup i don't think it goes to the scorecards either way so maybe you play the under or maybe you just play that does not go the distance uh you can probably parlay jack della maddalena because i even though the odds are probably just stupid at this point he probably should win like, uh, out of a hundred times, you run this out a hundred times. I think Della Maddalena wins it maybe 90. I'll give 10 to Danny Roberts because you know what? He's still, he's still a good striker. Like I said, still can get the job done. His record's not shot. It's not like he's just getting beat by everybody. So, so I'll, I'll give it 90% of the time. You got Jack Della Maddalena winning this fight out of a hundred times, 90 of them. That's just my thought. Uh, let me know what you guys think. Jack Del Maddalena is the official pick. Decent parlay piece. Maybe throw him, throw him earlier with uh, Brady High Stand. Uh, he Stand, High Stand, whatever it is. Throw him with that. That's a decent play. I think it gets you pretty close to even money there just for the fact that it's a two-legger. But let me know what you guys think. Let's go to the next one. Stop what you're doing right now. The under two and a half in this fight, I saw it a moment ago. I think it was minus 130. Those are playable odds. And by golly, I don't think this fight makes it past two and a half rounds. Pause this video, go place your bet, and then come back to it. All right, did you get it? You got the bet place? Great. Let's talk about the fight, and I'll tell you why. And if you still didn't, if you didn't already go do it, you'll at least know why I said that. Andre Fialio coming in three and two in his last five fights takes on Muslim Salakov four and one in his last five fights. This matchup, all of the physical intangibles are going to be on the Fialio side. The guy's six foot tall with a seventy four inch reach, as opposed to the 5'11", 69 and a half inch reach for Salakov. Which that's a short wingspan for a guy that tall. Um, interesting, but yep. Yeah. Azum Salakov, he's also 38 years old, whereas Fiala is 28 years old. So 10-year difference in age. We all know about that stat now. Everybody brings it up, whatever. Um, here's why this is going to be an interesting, interesting matchup. We have the high-level striking of Muslim Salakov. Wushu Sanda background, we all know that. Very good striking. Can He can put you down, don't get me wrong. He also can wrestle. He just doesn't do it as often, but he can wrestle. On the other side, we have a guy with very good striking in his own right. That left hook is money for uh, Andre Fialio. He also has really good forward pressure. And I say that because he just walks through punches and gets hit. Point that out there. He just gets hit a lot. If you look at his striking differential, dude throws high volume and gets hit a lot. That's just what he does, but he just keeps going forward. He does not stop going forward. And he's going to force a guy like Salikov to strike with him. And although Salikov may want to mix in that takedown, that wrestling, guess what? Fialio's got solid takedown defense. He's hard to take down. So I think this is going to be a striking matchup. And if we've known anything about Fialio, he does not stop going forward. And he can be rattled while he's going forward against just about anybody that's going to hit him in the face because he's going to let you hit him in the face. And if you hit him enough times, he's going to stumble a little bit. But guess what? He's going to try to knock you out before you knock him out. So for a guy like Muslim Salikov, who in the past has been a little hesitant at times, kind of picking his shots a little bit better, he's not going to have that opportunity here. 
So either Muslim Salikov is going to knock out Andre Fialio or Andre Fialio is going to knock out Muslim Salikov. And that's how I see this fight going just about every time. If you ran this fight 100 times, darn near 100 times, somebody gets knocked out. Now, I will pick who I think is going to win. I would not bet who I think is going to win. I mean, the values there on Fialio, I get it. I think you can still get him at even money or plus money somewhere. And I am going to pick Fialio because of the age difference. He does have the reach advantage. And I just like a guy that walks forward and throws punches against a guy that can sometimes want to pick his shots a little bit better. Muslim Sol Salikov getting up there in age, but the dude can still throw. Yes, he got TKO'd by Li Jing Liang. Li Jing Liang's a very talented fighter. He didn't look like it in the in the Hamza Chimaev fight, but you know what? Who really has other than Gilbert Burns? Either way, Muslim Salikov still a good fighter. Andre Fialio, yes, he got knocked out in his last fight. Jake Matthews is a beast, so he's still a good fighter. For me, I will pick Andre Fialio, but I have no interest in betting this fight money line. If you're looking for a bet, it's that under two and a half, or fight does not go the distance if you want to play it even safer. Because, my goodness, can you can you imagine a world where an Andre Fialio fight against anybody goes the distance? Because I sure can't. Yes, he can do it. it it's possible. But the way this guy fights, it just, it's a car crash waiting to happen. And with a guy like Muslim Salikov that strikes the way he does, that's why I lean that way. So the official pick is under Fialio. Let me know what you guys think. Love to hear your feedback. Do you think I'm crazy? Do you think this fight goes to decision? Because sometimes that does happen when you think it's an obvious under two and a half situation, then it goes to decision. It does happen that way. I just can't see it. So let me know what you guys think. Let's talk about, uh, let's talk about our next fight. Heavyweight matchup here, which clearly was kind of a short notice fight because... Sherman was supposed to fight on the previous card, uh, previous fight night card, a couple weeks ago. Uh, he was supposed to fight uh, Parisian. Parisian ended up in the hospital with something or another. Waldo Cortez Acosta did fight a couple of weeks ago. He was fought Jared Bandera. And now he's fighting again. So kind of a thrown together fight here. I don't have a ton on the board because I don't think a lot of it's necessary. I could have included a bunch of crap that you don't need to hear about. I'm just putting the stuff that I think is going to make sense in this fight. So that's where we're at. For Waldo Cortez Acosta, he's 8-0 in his entire career, 5-0 in his last five, obviously. On the other side, we have Chase Sherman, who is 1-4 in his last five fights. Doesn't look good, but he is coming off of a win, a knockout victory over Jared Bandera. Interesting enough, both of these guys' last fight was Jared Bandera. And that is going to give us a really good sample size for how they compare uh, in recent memory against a common opponent. So, yes, I know that doesn't always add up the same, but it at least gives us something to go off of. In this matchup, though, both guys have good boxing. Chase Sherman, he comes from a bare-knuckle boxing background and did really well there, was the champion in bare-knuckle boxing at, at one time or another. On the Waldo Cortez at Costa side, he also is a bit of a boxer with quick hands. His hand speed is much better than most boxers in the UFC. I say in the UFC because very high-level legitimate boxers are going to have better hand speed, even at the heavyweight division, than Waldo Cortez at Costa. He was not... He was not a top-tier boxer, but he's a good boxer in his own right, and I, I will say that, so there it is. Anyway, here's the thing that's interesting to me. In his last fight a couple of weeks ago, he ate so many leg kicks. I know everybody's going to point this out. Yeah, he ate a lot of leg kicks. There's no way he could be healed, but he ate a lot of leg kicks. There's no way his leg's going to be feeling great by then, and if he starts eating a couple in this fight, that's going to suck for him because he just did two weeks ago, and his leg looked like crap. So on the other side, Chase Sherman, he has a decent leg kick. He doesn't really do a whole lot other than box, except for the leg kick. So here's the thing. For me, I don't think either of these guys are going to go very far in the UFC. Don't get me wrong. Chase Sherman's already been there, done that, got cut, came back in, did the UFC a solid. And yeah, he got a win in his last time out. But yeah, I mean, he's not going to—he's not getting any championships. He's not beating any top five guys, top 10 guys, top 15 guys. I just don't see it. For Waldo Cortez Acosta, same deal. I just don't see him getting getting all the way up there. Maybe I'm going to be totally wrong about the guy. I don't see him getting super far. Grappler's going to be able to take him down. Uh, guys that can mix in the kicks obviously have can land their kicks on him. He's basically a boxer doing MMA, from what I understand, from the way I've seen him fight. So for me, I'm going to pick Chase Sherman here. I would not bet anything on this fight. I don't trust Chase Sherman for anything. The guy's 1-4 in his last five fights. I guess the guy's 5-0 and in his last five. Just the level of competition is vastly different. I'm going to take Chase Sherman here. I think the leg kicks are going to work for him. He does have a decent leg kick, like I said. If he mixes those in with the boxing, I think it's going to make his hands look quick enough to keep up with the fast hands of Waldo Cortez Acosta. Wouldn't bet anything on it. 
This is the fight. <laughs> I don't even know if this one's worth kicking my feet up on the coffee table and cracking up my root beers, because... Gosh, I don't, I mean, I don't know how good of a fight it's going to be. Maybe it'll be great. Maybe it'll be fireworks. But we also might get a really boring fight where uh, Waldo gets kicked in the leg a couple times and gets boxed up a little bit. And then we have, uh, you know, the standard heavyweight fight where both guys are like, yeah, let's try grappling and then lay on each other. I don't know. Maybe we get that. But we might also get a slugfest. And that's what I'm counting for. So in that, with that said, I'm hoping for the slugfest. I'm, I'm going to pick Chase Sherman. Going to kick my feet up on the coffee table. Gonna crack open my cold root beers and enjoy the fight. So that's where we're at. We've got a couple fights left. Let's go to those. In our light heavyweight co-main event. We have Kennedy Enzichukwu. I think so how you say that. Against Ian Kutialaba. Uh, Kutialaba coming in one, three, and one draw in his last five fights. Three and two on the Enzichukwu side. We have a massive height and reach discrepancy here. So for Enzichukwu, he's six foot five with an 83 inch reach. The dude's huge against a six foot one, 75 inch reach on the Kutialaba side. Will the height and reach play, adva uh, play an advantage for Nzichukwu? I think it will in this fight because, I mean, that's a, that's a big difference in, in range that you can hit a guy before he can hit you. That is huge. That is a massive difference. So for me, that is a big, big factor in this fight. Some fights it is, some fights it's not. This one, it's going to be a big factor. Here's, here's one other thing. So for young Kutialaba, we all know it. It's the, the same deal in all of his fights. The dude comes out aggressive, super fast starter, uses a good wrestling, throws big power shots, done. Rap first round, if he didn't finish you, guess what? He's probably going to lose the next two. I mean, that's how a guy like him can end up in a draw. You know, the guy will come out, win the first round, very impressively, 10-8 somebody, and then just lose the next two rounds because he's got nothing left in the gas tank. Do I think that's a drawback? Sometimes. Sometimes it's great. Sometimes the fact that he comes forward and just throws reckless abandon works out great. But as you can see in his last five fights, it hasn't worked out that darn well for him, has it? So, on the Zichukwu side, he's looked better in his last five, three and two. It's a lot better than one, three and one. He does have good power, does have good takedown defense. The problem is he's a very slow starter and he's inconsistent. Sometimes you know what you're going to get out of him. Other times you don't. Sometimes he lives up to the hype. Other times he doesn't. We don't really know what we're going to get out of Njichukwu. And for, for me, that means I can't place a bet on this because I don't know what to expect out of him. Do I think he beats Ion Kutialaba? Yeah, most of the time, especially if he gets past the first round. For Kutialaba, do I think he can beat Njichukwu? Yeah, probably in the first round if he does. This might be a fight where after the first round's over, you place a bet on Njichukwu. Just regardless of what happens in the first round, you place that bet. I mean, short of him like breaking an arm or something or a leg or whatever, but... You know, whatever. If, it's, if, it, if nothing pops out of place or is broken, maybe you place a bet on his check clue because he's probably going to win the second and third round. For me, though, I don't want to place a bet on it before the fight starts because there's a chance that Kuzilaba gets this one finished right away. He does have a really good aggressive style. Will come forward with power, wrestling. Yes, I know the good takedown defense over there, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything with a guy like this in the first round. The guy's coming to take your head off. He's coming to take your soul. Yes, he can lose in the first round as well. We've seen it happen. Ryan Spang got him out of there. Uh, gosh, I don't know how Ryan Spang keeps winning fights, but he does. Anyway, Mr. Chuck Wu, he's the pick. I think he has all the physical intangibles here, being 6'5 with an 83-inch reach. Hits like a truck. Dude does have good takedown defense. I just can't trust a guy who starts really slow against a guy who starts really fast and just isn't always the most consistent in his fights. The 3-2, and two, a lot of that is because of the inconsistency because the guy's got all the physical skills in the world. He just needs to put those physical skills in with consistency and, and it, if he mixes it all together, the guy's going to start winning more fights. So I do think he wins, probably more often than not, but I can't trust it until after that first round. That's when you place the bet if you really want to bet on this fight. If you're a total degenerate and you have to do it, wait till after the first round and see where you're at. You might get really good odds on Njichuklu. If it ends in the first round, well, guess what? There you go. You, you just don't have to bet on it. You can just watch it and enjoy. Let's go to the main event. We have a big banger of heavyweight main event coming up. So let's get Oops, to it. I feel like we're flying through this card. We've already found ourselves at the heavyweight main event. Uh, before we do that, if you haven't done it already, like the stinking video. If you've enjoyed this content and you'd like to stick around and see some more content like this, I do all the UFC fights, all the Bellator fights, all the Dana White's Contender Series fights. If you'd like to see those videos broken down in a similar style with my trusty marker board here, go ahead and subscribe to the channel because guess what? That's how you see that. If you subscribe, you want to like to see my videos pop up on your stuff. Um, plus, it helps me out because if I can get to a thousand subscribers, I guess they can start paying me ad revenue. That's cool. So do that for me. Like the damn video. So let's go to the main event. Here we go.
Uh, Derek Lewis coming on against uh, Sergey Spivak. Sergey Spivak. Okay, both guys, big heavyweights. Both guys got some skills in different areas. This is a tough one to break down. We've got a lot of tough ones to break down. I uh, I don't like a solo pick in this match matchup. I'm going to tell you that now. But there's a way to play it. I'm going to give you the shot on how to play it. But let's get into the details first. The nitty gritty, if you will. Two and three for Derek Lewis in his last five. He hasn't looked great lately. He's been getting finished. But he can also finish him, and that's how he's going to win fights. It's just finish or be finished at this point in his career. It's from what it seems. Used to not be the case, but it has been lately. It used to be he'd finish you. He still had a chance to win a decision. You probably weren't going to finish him, but you could win a decision over him. Either way, Spivak, 4-1 in his last five fights. I do believe that one loss is to Aspinall. Uh, not, no shame in that. Aspinall's a bad boy. Uh, anyway, we do have a big discrepancy in age, though. 27 years of age for Spivak and 37 for Derek Lewis. We all know how that works. The 10-year age gap statistic, it's like 70-something percent of the time or whatever. The younger guy wins when it's 10 years or more. Cool. Got it. 27, 37. Everybody plays all the money on Spivak. Just kidding. Don't do that. Let me finish this, okay? Here's what we got. We have a guy in Ser Sergey Spivak who his best path to victory, take you down, ground and pound you. Why? Because that's what he does so well. He can submit you, yes, but the takedown and the ground and pound, that's going to set everything up. That's what he does. He can push you up against the cage, win minutes that way. Um, pushing Derek Lewis up against the cage is a little scary because he still can throw power from there. Uh, I don't know how. He's just He's got magic power hands, all right? I don't know. But either way, Sergey Spivak, the grappling is his best path to victory. If he tries to strike with Derek Lewis, that's just going to be like playing with fire. You, you do it long enough, you're going to burn your house down, okay? You might get away with it for a while, but eventually your house catches fire because you caught the curtains on fire. Next thing you know, you're panicking, you're freaking out, you're throwing jugs of water on it, and next thing you know, well, guess what? The house is gone, it's on fire, you lost everything you own. That's what happens when you sit there and try to strike with Derek Lewis. It's not a good idea. Uh, for example, Alexander Volkov learned that back in like December of 2018. Why do I remember that? Because it was the Khabib Connor card. Same card where Tony Ferguson fought uh, uh, Anthony Pettis in like a, the bloodiest fight of all time. Either way, uh, Alexander Volkanov, or Volkov, and there's that Volkanov. Volkov, I tried to go Volkanovsky. Alexander Volkov was fighting Derek Lewis, won damn near every second of that fight. I don't know that Derek Lewis landed a single shot up until the last 10 seconds of that fight, five seconds of that fight even. Then he just knocks out Volkov, no big deal. Okay, cool, there you go. Guess who was playing with fire for too long? Guess who caught the curtains on fire and his house burned down? Volkov did. Spivak probably won't do that. He's not that dumb. Volkov learned the hard way. Don't be dumb. I do like Volkov. I'm a big fan of the guy, but he, he was dumb that night. He played with fire too long. Either way, Derek Lewis, the guy has spectacular power in his hands. It's something mythical. He just knocks people out. It's what he does. It's kind of like Francis Ngannou has the same thing. They just hit you and you go to sleep. People have said Derek Lewis hits harder than Francis Ngannou. I believe Curtis Blaze said that. And Curtis Blaze has been knocked out by both of them. So there you go. Um, the cool thing about, uh, for, at least if you're a Derek Lewis fan, the cool thing for Derek Lewis, that power carries in the fight. Like I pointed out in the Volkov fight, he'd been beaten pillar to post for dang near 15 minutes, 14 minutes and some odd, and like a lot of seconds. And next thing you know, boom, one shot, puts him down, finishes him out. That's it. That's all it takes. His power is there. The other thing that is the wild card here, Derek Lewis has the ability to just get up. He does it. I don't know how he does it. He just gets up. When you take him down, he gets up. How many times can he do that though? He doesn't understand. He doesn't understand why people can't just get up because he just gets up. It's because he's explosive and powerful. It's the truth. It's the truth. And you're that strong. This guy's just freakishly strong. Uh, when you can do that, yeah, I mean, that works for you. How long will that work? I don't know. Spivak's going to find out in this matchup, I do believe. Here's how you play it if you want to play it. Because, okay, my official pick, I would be dumb not to. I'm going to take Sergey Spivak. I'm rooting for Derek Lewis. Feet on the coffee table, cracking up my root beers finally, kicking back, enjoying this one. I got two root beers on this fight, sitting there, enjoying the heck out of it. I want to see Derek Lewis win because, gosh darn it, that's just so fun. Then we get him in the post-fight interview. Those are always fun. But Spivak should win. If he doesn't, he got knocked out by Derek Lewis, and that's a real possibility, so I won't be betting this. I won't be betting on the Derek Lewis side either because the reason why, well, guess what? Derek Lewis has burnt me in three of his last five fights when I bet on him to win by knockout, okay? But if you want to play this, you're a total degenerate. You have to play it. Sergey Spivak. You take Spivak by just money line. Probably money line. It's probably your best bet. 
He's probably taking money line because he, he has too many paths to victory. He can get the TKO. He can get the submission. He can get the decision. I wouldn't trust it anyway other than just money line. He's not so much a favorite that he's going to be um, that he's going to be like impossible to play straight. He's a big favorite, but not that big of a favorite. On the Derek Lewis side, you take him by knockout. Why? Because it's, he's already the underdog. You can get a little bit better odds to play him by knockout. Just enough to cover your ass. Because guess what? Chances are Spivak wins. But if he doesn't, you want to have something covering you. And that's where you play the Derek Lewis side, okay? You just got to make sure the numbers even out. I don't know if they do. I'm sure that there's a way you can make it work. If not, guess what? Just leave this one off. You don't have to be a total degenerate. They have a gambling thing, uh, 100 bets off. You can call them. You can. It's okay. Uh, don't, because then you're a quitter, but you can. Either way, just kidding. Don't actually call them if you need help. Um, anyway, in this matchup, I do like Sergey Spivak. I've rambled a lot here. I'm taking him to win. I don't want him to win. I want to see Derek Lewis get the knockout and just do that thing where he beats his chest and falls on the ground, and then we get to hear a cool-ass interview. I like that idea, but... It's probably not going to happen because this isn't a fairy tale. We all don't all get a cheer for Derek Lewis as he just defies odds again. So, Sergey Spivak's a pick. Let me know what you guys think. If you haven't done it already, like the stinking video. If you haven't done it already, check out my Bellator breakdown because, gosh darn it, I spent like nine hours or more breaking down fights for that video. It was a lot of time because there's a lot of guys on that card. I had no clue who they were. I'm going to make sure it pops up on the end screen here. But like this video, watch that video, like that video. I will see you in the next breakdown.